Hello and welcome to Unstoppable. I'm your host, Kerwin Ray, and today, oh, today we're getting fit and fairy. We're talking to Jacinta McDonald, who launched the US franchise Anytime Fitness into the Australian market. And now, with over 500 clubs in Australia and half a million Australian members, the business is going strong. She's also launched a not-for-profit, the Humankind Project, which funds life-changing projects in Africa and India, and has also opened Will, a yoga studio, where the I is actually a one. And in this conversation, we talk about the business being a family affair because she was working with her brother and she actually grew up in the fitness industry with her mum and dad. She didn't know how to sell anything or do anything at first, but she embraced sales and marketing. We talk about how she overcame that. We talk about how she flew to the US and met with the founders of Anytime Fitness and how they actually refused to give it to her, but she just wouldn't stop. This woman is relentless and she now has one of the most dominant fitness brands in the Australian gym market. We are going to talk all things fitness, fun, but also business and building it up. We're going to talk about her philanthropic projects, her investments and franchising versus just traditional business and the leadership lessons from building a big business. Listen up. You're going to enjoy this one. This episode is brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for businesses. If you have ever wanted to grow your business faster than what you can right now, if you need to make more revenue, if you need more leads, if you need more clients, if you need to know how to plan your business in a strategic way in order to hit big goals, if you need to learn how to scale your business and grow your team and your business so that you have more freedom, then this program is for you. Imagine three days immersed with me where we cover all aspects of business, but we do it from an immersive but also an execution standpoint. We execute every step of the way and we're looking at five key areas we're looking at your psychology we're looking at your marketing your sales your leadership and we're looking at your planning and how we integrate these five key areas to grow your business and your brand quickly so if you'd like to find out more information kerwinray.com Ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you, I'm a little bit giddy, slightly excited, because we have Jacinta McDonald, one of the co-founders of Anytime Fitness in Unstoppable today. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. You really should be unstoppable with what you've done. What an impressive creation you've uh, yep. you've, you've put into the world. It's a bit of a journey. How long have you been at it now? Um, so we launched in, tw- in 2008. 2008? Yeah. Okay. 11 years. Wow. And you yep. built now, let, let, let's let's go to the, we'll fast forward to the, the end. Yeah. Anytime Fitness, where are you at right now? How uh, big? 505 clubs. 505 clubs. Yeah, that's a lot. That's, that's like a, that's the biggest adult yeah. daycare center I think I've heard <laughs> of. <ever. laughs> yeah. 505 clubs. How many members? Over 500,000. Wow. Yeah, active members. So you're literally changing half a million people's lives yeah. on an almost daily basis. Yeah. Do you talk revenue? Uh, over 400 million a Over year. 400 million yeah, dollars a, a year in revenue. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, so your brother, what? We'll, we'll get into the whole story of this, but yeah. um, where did it all begin? Uh, I grew up in, in the fitness industry, so okay. my parents had gyms in the 80s, right. and so my brother and I would get picked up from school, from primary school, and literally go to the gym. Is that right? And that's where we would do our homework, yeah. And so how old were you in the 80s, if I'm allowed to ask that question? I was, how old was I? I'm 74 born, so I'm 45 this 74? year. 74? Yeah. I'm 74. Oh, there you go. October? May. May. I'm older than you. Wow. Yeah. That doesn't happen very often. <laughs> <laughs> Normally got all these young influences in yeah. here. Okay, that's cool. And so in the 80s, you would get picked up after yep. school, you'd end up in the gym. Yep. So mum and dad had a gym? Yep, they did. Whereabouts? They had a few. So um, Mount Druid. Okay. Um, Windsor, which is where I grew up, right, and where else? Blacktown, right. So they kind of did. My dad was my dad is a serial entrepreneur. Was he also a, a trainer as well? Like, was he a bodybuilder? No, he was an ex um, professional league player. Actually, wow. My dad, yeah, my dad played. He retired in seventy four. Okay, he was the captain of the grand final of the Bulldogs in seventy four. Is that right? Yeah, that's quite the claim yeah, to fame out there. Yeah, my dad's. Amazing. He's a legend. <laughs> yeah, that's how I want Noah to talk about me. Like that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. and um, so this really is a family affair. Yeah, so we grew up in the industry. Right. Um, as soon as we left school in 91, I left school. 92, okay. we opened a gym. So I had no idea what I was doing. Neither but, did my brother. Re- but you'd been in the gym business for so long. But yeah, but I didn't know how to sell or do anything. Okay. Um, so I learned how to teach aerobics. And uh, then we worked out, oh, okay, you need to sell memberships. Right. So it started in 92. So in 1992, and I'm going to assume you would have been 1992, you would have been 18 years of age. Yeah. Uh-huh. You set up your very first gym. Where was that? In Windsor. In Windsor. Yeah. You have no idea how to sell memberships. Zero. So how many people were there opening day? We had a lot. 
Yeah, I right. don't know how. Now okay. I look back, I'm like, I don't even know how the people turned up one day when I think that was just all our friends. And we had a consultant come in and we quickly learned that we knew nothing about anything. And my brother was 20 and right. we really started to embrace how to sell memberships. And we got really, really good at sales and marketing. And we had that business for five years. What was that business called? It was called Club Fitness. Okay. And we opened it for 25 grand because back then there was no cardio. And so you just had this big aerobics room and we had some really crappy weights and um, we had great classes. I, I taught my first aerobics class when I turned 18 on my birthday. Right. And Your so first I, class. Yeah, my first class. <laughs> Happy birthday. And um, so we just learned from there. It was, it was A lot of it was prepaid. There wasn't direct debit or auto pay. There was this kind of this. The industry was quite raw. Yeah. And so we had that business for five years. We sold it in 97 and it actually closed nine months later. Wow. Yeah, so the owner was just didn't he just didn't take on any sales or marketing. That happens a lot in the gym happens industry, a, though. Happens, yeah. and back then it really happened a lot. Yeah, because there was a lot of prepaid memberships. Yeah, and, you know, have recurring revenue, and and um, so yeah, we sold that in '97. Wow. Yeah. And so, what happens after '97? '97, I worked for Firmwood, so I decided that I wanted to work for the largest you got chain. A job. Okay. Yeah. So I sold myself in. They didn't need anybody, but I was like, I will just. So I sold myself in as a consultant, performance consultant for their franchise, Ease. Right. So I did that for a so bit. So as a, almost like a performance consultant on the business side. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And my brother went to Melbourne and did a similar thing for someone else. Okay. So we kind of worked together on and off since we started. And we both did that for a few years. So he, was he involved in club fitness with you when you yeah, got them? Yeah, we did okay. it with my mum. With mum? Yeah, mum was there. Mum used to teach aerobics. Oh, my God. My mum's awesome. Go, my, and dad. Why well, yeah, you clearly fantastic. come from a good clan. Yeah. And so uh, what was your brother's name? His, his name's Justin. Justin. And so Justin, he got involved in Firmwood with you, did he? He, he did, actually, after... Um, Not a bad gig. No, I was there. So I was looking after two states okay. in operations, and he came and looked after two states. And we did that for a few years. Okay. I don't know what year I left. But then you had the itch again? Is that what happened? Then I really wanted to do my own thing. I wanted my own brand. So I bought a club in the uh, the city, in the CBD. Which one was that? Uh, It was called, when I bought it, it was called Female Fit. Female Fit, yeah, Yeah, okay. It was a... um, Yeah, so they had, they were a firm wood, but they debadged, so I bought that. Okay. Then I rebranded it and and moved it, relocated it, in, in, still in the CBD. Okay. And then it was called She... She health club, yeah. Okay, three hundred and nine George Street. Okay, and um, I had that for Justin was still at Firmwood, I think then, and so I had that club for a while. And then my brother and I opened a second CBD club. Okay, which, another she, another she. Now weirdly, they are both anytime, so we, they ended up converting when really? we yeah. They're now okay. two very successful anytime clubs in the CBD of Sydney. Is that right? Mm. What, and so I'm curious. There's a little bit of a side tangent here. What mm. made you convert from being a female only gym? Mm to being anytime was this after the anytime had already launched and you guys did it in retrospect or so in 2002 they launched in the u.s okay so we i launched she i always do this by children how old was tundi <laughs> tundi was tundi was two so i, I think i bought female. historical measure i know it's like well, how old was she so it was 2002 when i when i launched she okay and so that was when anytime started i didn't know about them then okay um and then in 2007 we came across the 24 7 concept right so we were both working in the cbd clubs my brother and i saw a um there's a magazine like a, it's called ursa but anyway it tells me it tells everything about what's happening in the u.s and it does a franchise edition in may okay and I still remember my brother coming in with the magazine going, you have to look at this. And I was like, what is it? And uh, and, and we saw the, the concept and started to see what traction they were getting. So they had 600 open then. Right. And I was just like, we're going. And so we flew to the US three weeks later and met with the founders of Anytime and the founders of their competition, Snap. Uh, thought we, we thought we would love Snap. I shouldn't probably say this, but anyway. That's all right. We thought we would love it. And we just didn't. And then we met the Anytime guys and I'm like, oh, this is it. This is amazing. Yeah, right. And they weren't ready to franchise out of the US. They hadn't gone anywhere globally. Um, And they already had two different other people from Australia trying to get the rights as well. They'd already been approached and they were like, oh, we're not really ready. And I was just like, oh, this is so fantastic. And so we did four trips over 12 months back to the US doing our due diligence and really trying to convince them that, one, they should come to Australia and two, we were the people that, that should do it. And so we finally got the rights in May 2008, we launched. Wow. So it took 12 months. 12 months back yeah. and forth. Yeah. Yeah. And since then, it's just blown up. Nuts. 
Absolutely nuts. Yeah. So when you consider since 2008, you've gone from one to 505 studios, from one member to 500,000 members. Yeah. Like clearly there's a lot of stuff that's happened between 2008 mm. and 2019, but 11 years isn't a long time. No. Uh, you know, because, and again, you, I don't know if you know this about me, but my, my first job was actually in gyms. <laughs> like awesome. b- before school, like I literally, I'd catch a cab from my house at 4.30 in the morning to open the gym at 5 a.m. every morning and then I'd finish at 8.30 every morning and I'd have to run to school to get there on time. That's awesome. And then I'd work there in the evenings to do clothes and on the weekends as well and yeah. So similar, our, our part-time jobs during high school were in gyms. Yeah. That's what we did. Yeah, but one of the things I did is I, I got tra- as an employee I got traded in in a period of five years I got traded through about three four clubs because the club would you know it would set up it'd go well then it would either sell or shut down and then someone would come and take the carcass yeah. And, yeah. and redo it again. So, but what you've gone and done you've gone and actually built a behemoth of of an empire in an industry that is wrought with fragility like it's it's mm. an industry that is very fragile. Yeah, and often I think it's you know it's like many other industries but this one is probably more so prone to what I'm about to explain where you get people who become excited about fitness and then they go fuck i love fitness i want to train all day you know i should open a gym (laughs) yeah and then they open a gym and then six weeks later they go i know fucking nothing nothing about business (laughs) i can lift a barbell i can lift 100 kilo i can squat 220 but i don't know how to fucking open the cash register yeah so i i think what's interesting about your story and correct me if i'm wrong here you you did like quite the internship before you actually got ready to launch and that's why people are like you guys just came from nowhere and we're like no No. we really didn't 27 years to like from when we started to to, to now, wow! Yeah, so and we really in any time. Yeah, so we yeah. were we were really like um, in it for you know that's been our whole life. It's yeah. been our career and it's been what we've done. So you had to like learn your craft. Yeah. You had to you have to know about. So I'm curious to know from you: Has your strategy changed from a business owner's perspective from when you had one any time to now that you have 505? I think I think the principles are always the same in fitness. Yeah. So it's you know how many members can you um, retain? It's always it's always about how many new prospects. What's your conversion? You know, are these people happy? What's your culture? So that hasn't changed in fitness. Right. I don't think any any of the time. The competition is now so much more fierce than what it was when we started. Yeah, right. When we started, there was really fitness first. Um, and consumers had no choice. It was like 90 bucks a month. That was it. There was nothing else. You couldn't really, you, you didn't have a choice. And pe- there was actually a website called Fitness First Sucks. I remember do that. Do you remember that? I so do that was the that. time. Because that was the time when they were like crunching people on And they contracts. were just, they didn't care. They were so no. arrogant. Yeah. And um, so that was the time we launched. And that's why we knew this is like, consumers are going to go nuts because it's 24-7 access. Our, we, we launched at 49 bucks a month. So for a consumer, you've got top of the range equipment, 24-hour access, 50 bucks. It's like, it was incredible. Yeah, right. And so we just had this value proposition for consumers that wasn't just wasn't there. And then the franchise model was so strong because we were a really low staff model. So we can operate the whole business with one, one and a half staff, which wow. in a gym you can't do. Yeah. You've got front desk, you've got salespeople, you've got trainers, you've got all that stuff. We don't do classes, so your wages are really, really low. So we would go from, you know, a normal business or a normal club at that time, your wages would be about 30% of your revenue. So ours can be as low as 5% to 10%. Wow. So that was the game changer that people, I guess, didn't see. And we saw really clearly yeah, right. what the shift would be. And consumers just really took it up. And franchise sales were just, people just wanted more and more. And how many territories could I buy? And I suppose that model when it first came out, because again, someone who came from the industry, I was like, fuck, that's counterintuitive. Like, would you really trust you know, a bunch of members in your, in your club yeah, right. without anybody watching? Yeah, right. They're going to steal stuff. Yeah. And your insurance must be really high. Like, all the questions. Yeah, and even right. from consumers, they were like, is this, like, am I safe? And I'm like, there's cameras everywhere. There's members are completely aware everything's filmed. Nothing gets stolen. Um, members are, are great. It's their club. Yeah. You know, they've got their key and they can access it. So super safe. I've never had any problems more so than any other gym. Yeah. Um, so it's just overcoming those hurdles when we first started. Obviously, there was all those con- concerns around from consumers as well as the industry kind of went. They wouldn't talk to us for a few years. So. Yeah, right. Yeah, and it was, was disruptive at the oh, time. Well, was, when yeah. anything new comes through, you know, yeah, oftentimes people, you're going to resist, even you yeah. know, violently oppose in some yeah. respects before there's a, a level of acceptance yeah. which you now – you really are one of the most dominant brands in the fitness space, if not the most yeah, dominant Yeah, we're, we're the largest, yeah. 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 How does that feel when you hear that? Um, 
I still, I still don't really. The numbers are just. I just don't understand how. It, I'm just still surprised by where it's got to. Really? Yeah. Still, so this, like this you wasn't just part think, of a vision, like a grand vision. Like, yeah, it's all now happening. No. So we signed the the rights and said we came out publicly as soon as we launched and said we're going to have 350 between Australia and New Zealand. I don't know where we even came up with that number. It was yeah, just wow. like that's what we just thought we would do. The states were like, we think you can do 350, and we were like. Per capita, we were like, okay, sounds like we can. <laughs> and um, so then when we sold our 350th ter- ter- territory, I think it was about 2015. Wow. And then we were like, yeah, wow. And then it's we're still we're still opening clubs now. So, yeah. That's pretty crazy. impressive. Yeah. And so you and Justin, brother and sister. Yep. Uh, has it always been sunshine, blue skies and lollipops? Most of the time. Like we are really? polar opposites, which works. So what's your ethnic, ethnic, what's, what's your background? Ethnic, di- ethnicity, ethnic, I can never say that word. Fucking hell, that's a word. Um, Australian. You're Australian? So my mum, on mum's side, she has Chinese a little way back. Okay, right. Yeah, okay. that's it. And so you guys just gel. Polar opposites. Polar opposites, but it works. Yeah. You don't clash from a charge perspective. Being no. so opposite. No, I think the complete opposite. Like our strengths are totally different. But you clearly, you, there must be a relationship between you that enables you to leverage off that. Yeah, absolutely. Because most people who are polar opposites, they see the opposites as being negative. So annoying. Yeah. And so yeah. it becomes rather yeah. than a, a reason to collaborate, it becomes a reason to clash. Yeah. What have you guys done differently? Was it how you guys were brought up, or is it the way you relate? I think I think we both have always worked really hard, so we've always been driven, both of us. But Strong I think work ethic. Yeah, and yeah. that's from my dad and my mom, especially my dad. And he's awesome. Um, he's awesome. <laughs> he is. He's so awesome. Um, so I think we've always had that. And then I think we've always been driven. And I think we've always just, when you're good at that, you do that. I'm good at this. And we just, did, it was just like trust, 100% trust that you've got that. Okay, great. I don't even need to look at it. So we were able to really move fast because we each had our own jobs and we didn't really um, worry about what the other person was doing. So I think okay. that's why it's always worked. And so at what point did you guys go, okay, we're, we're growing at quite a rapid rate of knots here, you know, because that, that turnover, that's not, that's not a small turnover in any respect of any no. organization. Yeah. So at any point did you guys go, okay, we, we might need some help here if we're, if we're going to go like... Yeah, the, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> this morning, half an Every hour Every time ago. it was like, okay. Because um, did you guys take investment? No. We didn't. We, and we had no money when we started. Right. That was one of the reasons. So you guys we, still one hundred percent owned by the by the by the family. Yeah. Well, I sold out in twenty seventeen, so nearly two years ago. Okay. So my brother's still there without with the business partner who was at the beginning as well. So Richard right. Peel. Okay. Yeah. You had so a business he, partner at the beginning. He yeah. He yep. invested. Um, there was actually two guys that invested early in. Um, one's still there, and so they're still there. And the U.S. founders have have taken up some of my ownership when I exited. So it's but Justin's still there. Yeah, right. Yeah. And he's still going strong and loving it. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's good. So what about you now? Like, let, let, I'm, I'm curious to know a little bit more about you. Like, clearly you're, you're one half the equation and I, and I don't want to give um, Justin any, I don't want to avoid giving Justin shine. He's clearly mm-hmm. played his role. But what is it about you that you've learned? Because one of the things I've learned about being an entrepreneur, especially people who crack it at a very high level and maintain a very cool amount of composure it's quite a big uh, it's quite a game of self-awareness you've got to get to know who you are yeah in order to be in order to balance yourself out whether it be from you know from um a skills perspective or a psychological perspective yeah. or even just a charge perspective yeah. the more we understand about ourselves the easier it is to pair ourselves with the right people in certain situations i'm curious to know with you though like has self-awareness or or, or consciousness played much of a role in your journey yeah i think i think massively and especially from about once again, how old are my kids? <laughs> uh, so I started yoga, which was a massive shift for me from my training because right. I've always we've always trained, we've always exercised. But I went through, so it was two thousand and nine. So what's that? Yeah, nine or ten years. Started practicing yoga as more of a to de stress at the time. Okay. Any time was kind of going ballistic, and I was trying to fall pregnant, so I started to do yoga, and that was a really that was a huge tipping point for me. Um, so that really shifted the way that. I related to others, but mainly to myself, really started to become aware of my thoughts and, you know, where was I holding myself back and right. yeah. So that was the start of it. And then more into meditation in kind of 2014, what 2015. Style of meditation? So I studied with Gary Goro. So yeah, he's yeah, my boy. I know. He's amazing. He's beautiful. Oh. He's so good. He uh, so I studied with him and then I did some um, retreats and stuff with Dr. Joe Dispenza. So yep. sort of the neuroscience. So bits and pieces yeah, right. of stuff. Um, so that was about 2014, 2015. And then that's kind of now p- a big part of my life. Yoga is a massive part of my life. Okay. Um, and meditation comes in and out. But it's not really a daily practice yeah, all the time. Right. Um, but yoga's yoga's my staple. Okay. Yeah. 
so I'm curious during this journey, like what have you learned about yourself? I've learned that um, I'm pretty creative, which I didn't really know too much about myself. I am I am resilient. Right. Um, I can pick myself up pretty well. Um, if I listen to my intuition, I'm 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 pretty good. You're pretty bang on. Yeah. When I don't, I'm. Yeah. Have when you I was younger, a lot of experience of not listening to your intuition and and, and getting bit in the ass for it. Not badly. Probably um, I've been married twice. Okay. And probably they say it's better second time round. Well, I'm not married now. Oh fuck, sorry. Yeah, that's just okay. That. So third time round's great. So <laughs> third time's a charm. I just keep going. I was going. Yeah, I don't do that's marriage. Right. I just came out of my first one. I was actually doing it more for me than you, but that's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now I'm just like, I just don't do marriage. Um, with an amazing partner now, and yeah. I think that when I look back, I kind of go, "You like my, oh, I if I trust my gut, I'm pretty spot on." But I think there's times in our lives and with society pressure that we don't do that. We're just yeah. like, "Well, you should get married, and you should have kids, and you should do, you should, should, should." And um, as I've gotten older, I'm I really rebel what you should do. Yeah, much more than I did when I was younger. Okay. Yeah. So 2008 to 2000 and when you sold out, 2017. 2017. I'm not going to assume it was all just, uh, again, sunshine, lollipops <laughs> and rainbows. What were some of the major fuck ups that perhaps no one had any clue about that mm. were really quite devastating, either personally or commercially, that you had to, had to deal with and overcome? I think commercially we have had an amazing run. Um, so we've got less than two percent closures, which in franchising is wow. yeah, incredible because they, they, it's a great business model. It's so strong, and the yeah, brand's right. so strong. Um, so commercially, all, all your normal, all your normal challenges with growth, like you know, wrong people at the wrong time, and too many, too little people, too many people, um, and just structure of your business, and 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 franchising is a unique business in itself. Yeah. In managing those relationships, so I think all your traditional challenges with franchising we've had. Um, but because our franchisees are so successful, we haven't had the things that other franchises, the issues that other franchises yeah, right. have. If you've got happy franchisees because they're making money, you, your life's pretty good. Yeah. If they're not making money, it's a disaster. What are the statistics when it comes to franchises making money? Well, better than better than if you're a standalone. Yeah. Um, and well, standalone's not fucking great. Let's be honest. It's terrible. Yeah. And understandably, yep. it's, it's tough, right? It's very difficult. Yeah, and um, franchising is a lot higher success rate and yep. per capita Australia is way up there with franchising. We love franchising. Yeah, we do. Because um, it's, you know, it's, tell me how to do it and we, our work ethic's good. Um, and so I think we sort of lean towards, okay, I'll be part of this and, and, and I think there's absolutely strength in brand. So there's no period um, during that massive growth phase where things were going wrong or you had to keep it together or there was some kind of personal tragedy <laughs> that came your way. And, yeah. um, so I got what, – what year did I – I got divorced in 20 – how old soul? 2014, I separated 2013, 2014. So that was tough, Yeah, I think. Um, he, we're still obviously close friends. He's still in any time. He's got a bunch of franchises and yeah, he's right. got some ownership in the UK anytime. So he's still very successful within that kind of space. Yeah, And I think that was challenging. Um, I, my, my youngest was six months at the time. And so that was a big, wow. that was a big shift for me. I just turned 40 and um, I was just like, this is just not where I need to be and what I should be doing. And I think that was that was probably um, – that was a challenge. Getting out was a challenge. I think being out's a challenge. Well, that's actually <laughs> was where I was going to go next because I can ima- only imagine – you know, I've heard this, this this spoken about and, you know, I've, I've never built – I've never had something consume so much of my life that I've sold that I've felt like, okay, well, who am I now? Yeah. But something I've heard consistently with, you know, with clients and friends that have built, you know, magnanimous businesses – that have become empirical in nature, when they sell it, they often go, well, fuck, who am I? Like yeah. without this behemoth behind me. Did you have, before you sold, was there any concerns about, well, what am I going to do? Or were you like, I'm just no. looking forward to getting out? Yeah, I think it was just, um, I just knew that it was time. Right. I just knew that I just needed space and just to be 100% aligned with what I wanted to do. I was just really time. And I'm great. I'm good at startup. Yep. The day to day grind uh, going forward, I'm kind of like, yeah, like I'd love board meetings and strategy days, but you know, it's once a month. Yeah. And so, um, and I started a yoga business in 2015. I was really enjoying that. And so it was time. Okay. Um, so I didn't really have time to think about it during the process of exiting. But then when you're out, you're like, yeah, wow, like this is interesting. What's been the hardest thing to acclimatize to since you left? I think, you know, 
I'm not 60. I'm not really ready to retire. So my question is. You didn't leave to retire. Let's be honest. You had other business interests. Yeah. And we've got like, and I don't, you know, I've been um, lucky that I've invested well since since I've exited. Um, So I don't need to. But then what's been interesting is, okay, well, what, you kind of want to do something else. What is it? And now I'm like, geez. So that's a tough question because then I'm like, I is need to- Is that where you are now? Yeah. So okay. that's where I'm at now. Well, what happened with this yoga business? So it's there. I haven't really pressed the big green button, which I'm interested in by um, why I haven't done that. Yeah, right. So we're just I'm just giving myself the next few months of space just to kind of go, okay. Okay. Yeah. So you, you mentioned that you, you invest smartly. Where, like When you invest, where, what, do, what do you invest in? Um, I've got some investments in a few wellness businesses, but okay. they are really around- First of all, the people. Yep. Like who are the founders and, and what do they stand for? Okay. And then- Because it's almost like in this country, the moment you exit from something and you have a big exit- Oh, so many You get a fucking target on your yeah. back. Still. Yeah. And I'm just like, I've got really good at saying no. Yeah, good. Yeah. Um, learned that pretty quick. Okay. Um, but yeah, people, obviously the product, I feel like it has to have, the timing has to be right and the pe- timing and people are right. the two things that I really, um, really look at. Okay. Yeah. And um, Justin's, he's obviously in, he's in for yep. the long haul. He's, he's like ride or die. Yep. He'll, he, he's there till he's there till the end. Okay. But you do have some other projects that you're using to, to take up some of your time. I do. You're a little bit philanthropical. I am. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that and how we got to, to, to this place. How we got to here. So just after any time started, I remember going to a growth faculty event and I heard Muhammad Yunus speak wow. and... I just still remember it. You know, there's these days where you just some, you hear something and you're like, wow, that's like one of the most amazing things I've ever heard. So he spoke about a social business that he'd started and he won a Nobel Peace Prize. I don't remember what year. And I just remember listening to him thinking that is so incredible that you could use your business skills for a social purpose. And this was mm. 2008. Wow. And any time it just started. So we wow. were like so busy. But I just remember thinking that's like, it just blew my mind. And I think that really started my thinking around, okay, what, you know, what could you do? Um, how could you use these skills? So I didn't really do anything until, until 2014. Um, in 2014, I went on a trip to see, I guess, what was going on in certain countries. So okay. I went to Africa yep. and saw the work of the Hunger Project right. on the ground. Okay. Um, it's pretty sobering, isn't it? Yeah, so that was just a massive shift for me. I yeah. think I've travelled a lot and I've travelled in Africa a lot even before that. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I love being there. I've always loved being Actually, my first husband is African, so I met him when I was wow. over there. Yeah, so my daughter's um, half Zimbabwe and she's beautiful. Oh, They're wow. They're beautiful, but yeah, she's, yeah. yeah. She's the most beautiful. Yeah. So, but in 2014, I, I guess you really get to see the work that these communities um are going through with the way that the Hunger Project works with them, and it's a lot of it is around what's their vision and their commitment and their action for them to take to to um, remove themselves from poverty. So it's an it's an incredible leadership trip, and I went on that in 2014, and that was just a game changer for me. And is that what gave birth to the the Humankind Project? Yeah, so we launched that uh, May 2015. Okay, and this is your baby. This is my baby. All right, and you've also and Will is the the yoga studio, right? Yeah. So tell me more about the Human Kind Project. What was the genesis of this? You'd been in Africa, you, you had yeah. the inkling. It wasn't like you saw a com, you know commercial for World Vision and felt like you need to open no. the, the purse strings. So on that trip, I was with the CEO of the Hunger Project Australia at the time, Kathy Burke, who's phenomenal. And um, I think anyone who spends time with her ends up committing to doing something <laughs> way beyond themselves. <laughs> yeah, right. And I just kept writing down. There was a lot of journaling and workshops and stuff in terms of leadership. And I just kept writing down business for good. And I was like, I don't even know what business for good means. But I just feel like that's I need to be a voice for business for good. And so that was what humankind was really founded on the fact that I can write a check, but that's only a very small part of what I can actually do in the world. Mm. Um, so really started to encourage other entrepreneurs and people to really have a look at the work that the Hunger Project does and taking people over. And we've done three trips now with with our own entrepreneur groups. So you're like a charity supporting a charity with the yeah. Humankind Project. So we're a foundation that supports amazing work on the ground. So right. we don't do the work. So you um, provide visibility to those who need yeah. it. Yeah. Through and so these these events that you do, they're leadership orientated events, are they? Yeah. So we take or the Hunger Project actually facilitates them because the right. facilitation is second to none. Wow. I just grab a grump a group of people and go, okay, let's go see if you want some leadership, and you want to see stuff with a completely different lens with a new perspective. Let's go. I'm in. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, I'm in. Yeah, I know. Oh my god, it's amazing. I'm in. Can I yeah, bring a filmmaker amazing. with me? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we film. We usually film quite a bit of yeah, it. Yeah, right. How long does the, do these things go for normally? So four days in country. Okay. So. Um, yeah, you're in, you're way out in the middle of nowhere for four days. Okay. You come back to a nice hotel because we don't want everyone to suffer massively. But yep. during the day, you're on a bus, you're driving for three hours. You go out and meet these amazing communities, see leadership in action. And then we usually inclined. do a safari. I uh, usually do a three-day three safari at the end just to really decompress and, and everyone has a chance to kind of talk through what they've seen, what's going on, what's coming up for them. And how many people do you normally get on these? We usually take 10 to 15. Okay. Yeah. And these are normally business owners, industry leaders types? Yeah. Or? Yep. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so that's been – you did that when, You did that the first time in 2015? Yeah, first time in 2015. The last trip I think we did was 2017. Okay. Um, and there's about eight of us still from that trip funding a whole community. So we finish wow. hopefully funding them this year. They'll be in self-reliance, so they all won't need anything oh from anyone God, anymore. Oh, my that's amazing. 37,463 people we're supporting. Wow, in that yeah. community. Yeah. Holy it's smokes. A lot, isn't it? That's incredible. Yeah, so we all get to go back. Um, next year when they reach self-reliance and celebrate with them. So we're all we're very tightly knit still. So you really have w- woven your success into the fabric of social good. Yeah. Doing good for business with a social purpose. And it's interesting, you know, because we're having this conversation with some of my team this morning about how all businesses can do good at a social level now or have a social purpose. Yeah, absolutely. And they don't necessarily even, and I don't know how much you know about our business, but we were talking this morning how we get, you know, anywhere between two or three, sometimes four messages a month just on Facebook from people who got onto Facebook to basically say their goodbyes before committing suicide and then they stumble across a video and it changes their life and then they send us a message going, you saved my life. And we get that on a very regular basis. Um, and I'm a fucking business dude. Like yeah. I'm not a shrink. I'm not a. I'm not Tony Robbins. I'm just sitting there talking about business and putting content out there. But it really made one of the team members brought my attention to the fact of it doesn't matter if you're a, you know, you could be a, a baker, uh, a mechanic, a candlestick maker. It doesn't matter. It, it, how you communicate with your community has the ability to impact and create some con- incredible good. Absolutely. So what's what's next for you? Like wh- where are you going to take this? So humankind is is just. That will be something that I will do till I die. Right. Or and hopefully until we, we end hunger and poverty in 2030. So that's how our aim is, is to that be. the mission? Yeah, that's the mission. That's the global mission, actually. So the global goals, there's 17 global goals that um, in tw- in September 17, there's 173 global leaders all signed this this these global goals as to what they're all trying to achieve to end hunger and poverty by 2030. Wow. And the Hunger Project's always had that goal, weirdly. So then now they're just really aligned. So part of our mission at Humankind is to be part of that solution and part of that occurring. Um, so that's a given. Will um, has been a great place to be able to play in the space of social entrepreneurship. So right. we donate 10% of our revenue to the Humankind Project and right. that's communicated in, in every way that we can possibly communicate that to our members of our yoga community. Um, How big is Will? Talk, let's talk about still that. only one studio. One studio. Where yeah. is that? In St. Leonard's. In St. Leonard's. Yeah. Okay. How many? How many members? Uh, 200 and t- 240, that's which a, for yoga studios in a, 11, it's only been open 11 months. We had one in Surrey Hills, which we closed. Okay. Um, which for yoga is good in, really good in 11 months. Yeah. That's yeah. fantastic in 11 yeah. months. Yeah. And so is, th- is this going to be the next thing for Jacinta? Will? Potentially. I really Potent- love it. You seem like you're on the fence. I know. Like, and I think that I, I've been reflecting on it quite a bit over the last – and it's just because it's really – it's mine 100%. Yeah. And, um, you're used to having a wingman, I'm used you? to having collaboration. I'm yeah. used to having this because I'm, I'm the creative. Yeah. yeah. So I'm used to having this kind of – my brother's like is just the a executioner. diligent executioner. Yeah. And I just don't have that yet. And I just haven't found any staff member that's really been the, the person. And so I think that's where my – Probably, maybe, comes in okay. and um, either need to just get over it um, or find the person. Find the person or call yeah. them in. Yeah. Have you, how much time have yeah. you spent calling them no, in? No, I haven't. Because, I don't know, there's something about, like I just imagine right now if I was your life partner and I was saying, oh, honey, you know, should we commit to meet each other? And you're like, well, yeah, maybe. <laughs> it's like, well, that's not going to fucking <laughs> fill yeah, me with- it doesn't do anything. No, it's not going to yeah. fill me with confidence. And, and you're clearly an incredibly talented woman. So it's, it is curious. But it's also beautiful at the same time. Because I think sometimes people think, you know, once you achieve a certain level of success, you become bulletproof. But you, you're oh, human, absolutely. just like everybody absolutely. else, Absolutely. Right? And, and, you know, yoga is not the same as fitness. Mm. That's very clear. Like, I've learned that very clearly over yeah. the last two years. So I'm like, oh, wow, okay, that doesn't quite work the same. And so that's been really humbling as well to go, okay, what you know and what you've done doesn't necessarily work the same. It's very, very different, different, different community. 
different mm. sales process, different bunch of different stuff. And we've approached it in a different way. So it's an immersive studio. We've got, you know, we've it's a dimly lit. We've got we do our we do sequencing. So our te- instructors all teach the same choreography. So we've really approached it from a completely different spectrum. Yeah, right. Um, which has been super fun to create, and our members love it. And so there's been a whole creation process, which now I feel like that's kind of formulated. Now it's time to now's the time really to scale so the model works yeah the model's profitable yeah it's scalable yeah absolutely it's sellable yeah it's duplicatable yeah Fuck. I know and people are already ask me and I'm like just wait <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> can I buy a franchise yet. not yet oh wow okay um, yeah so it's it's exciting and I like yeah it's really exciting because it's quite interesting because you have every single skill under the sun that could possibly re- be required to do it yeah and I think for me it's you know it's really looking at hey, how do I want my life to look for the next 10 that's years that's a really good question which is where I really that's that's, that's really the most important question. question yeah for me but I think it's one that we often overlook in the early stages because we're more focused on the prize than we are. Absolutely. And the prize isn't the lifestyle. You know, cause, and again, I've, I've had this conversation a lot in the last week where people um, they go, oh, I just want to build a successful business. And then they build a successful business, they get on the dance floor and they can't fucking get off because the music is still playing. And if they get off, the music stops. And if the music stops, it all comes tumbling down. Yeah. And then when they go to scale, they don't scale. They just make them, they just put, turn the music faster. <laughs> yeah. And the music gets faster, but yeah. they still can't get off the dance floor. Yeah. And, you know, because it's interesting for me, especially in this business with a personal brand, uh, this is very much a dance floor kind of business. Yeah. But what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm doing is scaling the unscalable. But in the process, I keep asking myself the question that I wish I'd asked like 20 years ago. What kind of lifestyle do I want to live? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's for me, it's about what, how do you want to live and how mm. do you want to contribute? They're my two questions. And so Will has to fit into that. Yes, it could be this, this and this and AB. Like it's all there. But do, what do I want? You know, my kids are pretty little. I've got I've got an 18 year old. She's at uni. She's incredible. But then I've got a five year old and I've got an eight year old. Wow! And so they grow so fast. Oh, so fast. And it's just you wait most... till he's 18. Oh my god! Oh Settle my down. god! Everyone, calm down. Take a breath. And so it's like, okay, well, I don't need to do what I did with any time. I don't need to work mm. the hours. So it's like, okay, well, what do you really want? Like we yeah. live. I live a really simple life. So we've. We've got sort of taken minimalism in in the last 18 months to two years, probably more so than I ever have in my life. And it's like we don't need to do that at that pace anymore. Um, but you still have the drive and you still have the desire to create. Mm. And so for me, it's really finding a balance of, okay, well, how do you how do you do that? Are you finding that you're able to express that drive in other, other means outside of business? Because I'm finding for me, I'm really enjoying expressing my talents as a father from a leadership perspective yeah. more than in some cases than I am in the actual business itself. Yeah. And I think the humankind for me is that as well. It's really right. like how can I how can I contribute and how can I collaborate with these other amazing entrepreneurs through humankind. So yeah, that's right. a beautiful space that I play in. And through Will with the with the 10% and, and the one in Will stands for one human. Right. And so one member impacts one human. So that's, that's for me, is, that's contribution. But raising the kids is like my 18-year-old is – such a mirror of me that it's terrifying. <laughs> so she will do so things and I'll self. be like, God, that's so annoying that I so do that. And I'm like, wow. So she, I'm just like, oh, so she'll get super excited and talk really fast and interrupt people. And I'm like, so that's me when I get excited. <laughs> and so I'm like, ton. So I'm really, it's such a mirror for me that I realize if my energy's off, the whole house goes nuts. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, that's me. And I'm like, oh such a responsibility having the energy of the whole house so mm. three kids mm. and so that's great for me that's i'm able to see okay am i running too fast am i not being totally present what's that's going on awareness. yeah really and is. so it's so obvious with kids yeah so they, obvious that's it's their like, first language is energy it's so it's so obvious when i'm doing well within yeah. myself yeah um and you can't hide that like you can't hide if you're doing well within yourself with the kids or not yeah no i love that that's fantastic okay so will yeah. She's on the cards. The Hunger Project and the Humankind Project. For people who want to find out more about the human, I'm actually legitimately interested. Yeah, absolutely. So what have been, like when you talk about it from a leadership perspective, like what have been some of the biggest leadership lessons that you've learned through these, these projects? Yeah, I think, um, you know, all the stuff that we speak about at a high level of leadership, whether it's, so we will witness, usually on the ground when we're there, we'll witness one of the leaders going into a community that they're starting to work on talking to the community. So it's in another language, obviously you've got an interpreter. But one of the things they run is vision, commitment and action workshop. So before there's any work done in the area, they have to get the community to change their mindset. 
And so they talk. Wow. Of, yeah, it's incredible. This and so, so they smart. just um, spend sometimes two years talking to the village leaders, showing them other places where it's worked to go, okay, can you see a vision where there's no poverty in your community? And they just can't because generationally they've grown up in poverty. Yeah. They, they, they're not educated. There's no schools. It's there's no medical. So it's like how would they even be able to kind of see this, have a vision for it? So they spend the whole time starting to get people to really get excited about, okay, I can see a vision for a life for my children that's different to mine. And then they work through, okay, well, what's your commitment? What are you going to do with your two hands to make that happen? And then what are the actions that we need to do? So it's the most incredible leadership I've ever seen. Wow. And so you see that play out on the ground. You see them meeting with people that are like, well, where's the food? Why don't you do a food drop? And you see them, how they deal with those objections and how they really start to open people's eyes to a different perspective. And um, and then the process can be eight to 12 years is usually from the beginning right through to them reaching self-reliance and being completely oh, not relying on, right. on anybody. Yeah, it's incredible. It's the most amazing transformation. And so you're seeing all of that, but then at the same time, you're looking at yourself as a leader going, geez, like I've got all this opportunity and I'm whinging about this and I'm like where is my perspective? And so that's that's what I get out of the trips more than anything. And every trip's different because you see different things so mm. differently. But I think for the leaders that we've taken and the entrepreneurs that we've taken, you just come away going, I have absolutely nothing to complain about. Mm. My perspective is completely shift in, in what opportunity I have because we're educated. We have all these tools and you're meeting people that are as smart as you but haven't got the opportunity mm. and you give them any opportunity, the tiniest of opportunity and you hear the stories of what they've created and you're like, wow, they're oh, so God. resilient and so incredible. And so where can people find out more about the Humankind Project, the Hunger Project, what you do going over to Africa? Where do I sign? Yeah, so our website, so the Humankind Project is probably the best place to have a look. Okay. Um, you can kind of read a little bit about what we've done and then um, there's just a contact or they can contact me directly and ask about when our next trip is and okay. what we're doing. And Do you have any trips planned? There's, there's actually a Hunger Project trip in to Malawi, weirdly, at the end of this year, okay. which um, I know this space is still on. All right. Send me the – I'll get yeah. Bianca to reach out. Send me the dates yeah. across. And then we're looking – we'll, we'll be going again next year, 2020. Okay. We'll be going as the Humankind with the, with the Hunger Project facilitation. Okay. Yeah. Which would be the – which one do you recommend? The facilitation's incredible either way. Okay. I love the group that we create just because we do the safari at the end, which is my favorite thing in, yeah. in the world. Um, and I like that connection piece. I'm on the trip. Um, I don't facilitate, and I love not facilitating. I love just being part yeah. of it, and I just I'm part of the facilitation. I'm start part of the conversation. But um, so they're my favourites. But I but the but a trip directly with the Hunger Project is phenomenal. You still see everything that you would see with us. Yeah, right. And where can people find out more about um, Will Yoga? Uh, so Will dot co. And, and the, Will is I with is one, a one. Yeah, yeah, right. One human. One human. Yeah. And so they can find out more there. So, what do you want to leave behind? Like, what's what do you what would be your greatest achievement from a legacy perspective? I think for me, um, it's it's how I raise my kids is really the most important thing that I think. Um, Tundi's been to Malawi twice. My eighteen year old's been wow. twice. So she went when she was fourteen, and she went when she was seventeen. She's on the youth board of the Hunger Project now. <laughs> yeah, of course she is. And. Um, <laughs> Being able to shift her perspective at 14 is something I'll do with all my kids. So right. they'll, they'll all go and, and see the work that we support from about the age of 12 because I, it's just a classroom that you can't, mm. you can't explain to kids what, you know, and, and I just know how much it shifted my daughter and how grounded she is because of it. And we talk about it at home. So it had an instant impact when she went? Yeah, absolutely. You're seeing 13-year-old girls with babies and... Yeah. You know, you're seeing the reality of poverty mm. play out and you can't, the, you know, there's faces of women and men that, um, not in a bad way, but you just remember that they exist. Like I go to bed some nights and I'll picture, like I'm in my sheet, my comfy bed, and, and I'll think about where they're sleeping and, you know, and um, constantly gives you gratitude. Mm. Like we've got running water and just like all these things that you get from going over there and seeing how they live. So I want my kids to all know that. I want them to understand the opportunities that they have just by being born here. Yeah. Um, so that's the biggest impact I think I can have. And, and having these conversations, even with people to go, you know, you should be so grateful you have running water. Mm. Like 
I get out of bed and I'm like the beautiful carpet on my feet and there's tiles and like we're, we're so lucky. We are very lucky. We're, we're so blessed. lucky and um, we forget too many opportunities for us to choose from. We get stressed about what to choose, whereas it's like the opportunities just there's so much abundance. This is true. There are abundances everywhere. Best piece of advice that you'd leave someone with? I think I think as entrepreneurs we get so focused on our businesses and we completely lose focus of what we like what is the life that we're trying to live um I think we a lot of people forget about their health you can't you can't tell your kids to exercise if you don't exercise mm. like you they they do what you They're do. Echoes, they, aren't they, they they don't listen to they you. They say what we, you say. They do what you do. They do what you do. So in, if you want them to be healthy and you want them to exercise and eat well, then y- there's no excuses. So I think I get it. I that's something that I'm like. I hear people say, "Yeah, I know. I really want my kids to eat really well," and I'm like, "Well, what the heck? What are you eating? Mm. Are you training? Mm. I haven't got time. It's like, okay, so when they get busy and they get older, will you tell them, yeah, don't worry about training? It's not important. Of course it's important. So I'm lucky I grew up with that. Very. And um, I had this chat to my dad the other day. He had two strokes last year. So he's, he's got some, yeah, Shit. so he's got some disabilities now. But I went to see him and he was like, I'm not going to the gym anymore. I'm like, dad. Because he goes, to, he has a personal trainer twice a week. <laughs> And um, he's like, yeah, I'm not going. I'm just like, I'm not getting any better. And and he was really frustrated. And dad's an athlete. And I just had to say to him, what, like, what's going to happen with your body if you don't exercise? He's like, well, he got, and then he got really shitty with me because he knows I'm right. He's like, (laughs) well, we'll deteriorate. I'm like, yep. And then we, so we had this whole conversation. He's like, so I just fed him back what he's told me since I was born. Just what do you do when things get hard? Well, you work harder. What are you, like, just all the stuff. And Dad's just sitting there going, yeah. And he kept saying to me, that's what I used to say to you. And I'm like, but it's true. So I just think so much of my brother and I are so lucky to have been brought up in that, Mm. with that community, sorry, with that culture in our family. And I think for me, it's about what am I, how am I elevating what I'm leading, how how I'm leading my kids Mm. to the next level. Um, So that I love that. Yeah, leadership's not a, leadership is not a title, it's a behavior. It's not a title. Jacinta McDonald, this has been an absolute honor and a privilege and a real pleasure. Um, do you have a personal branded website where people can find yeah, more do, about actually. you as well? Yeah, I do, actually. Where's that? Uh, JacintaMcDonald.com. Fantastic. You are a breath of fresh air. Thank you. Thank you for coming on Unstoppable. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Wow. This episode was brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for business. There you have it, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Unstoppable with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And do me a favor, don't forget to drop me a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear what you think. I love reading what you guys have to say and your reviews. Make sure we keep creating killer content just like this. If you want to stay up to date with me and all my movements, please jump onto the website, kerwinray.com. And also check us out on social media at Kerwin Ray. 